the Olympic torch relay. We get you running with the torch. Taking on the MCG, new secret weapon from the AIS. It's a winner, definite winner. And Olympic fashion. Basically, I have them all wearing sarongs and sandals. What will our athletes be wearing at the Games? Hello and welcome to the Games, the show full to the brim of Olympic spirit. I'm Tracy Holmes. And I'm Neil Brooks. Today we'll be looking at some kids inspired by the Superfish and Peter Otteson, the Australian behind the Greenest Games. Yesterday marked the first step in the upcoming epic journey of the Olympic flame from Olympia in Greece to Homebush Bay in Sydney. The torch will travel for 100 days once it lands in Australia, beginning at Uluru and will cover an amazing 27,000 kilometres in all states until it's used to light the cauldron in Sydney's opening ceremony. SOCOG has just announced the specific route the flame will take as it crosses our country, so we thought we'd take you on an Olympic journey with a difference. It all begins here at Uluru on Thursday, June the 8th in the year 2000. And what a magnificent setting to mark the start of the largest torch relay in the history of the Olympics. That's awesome. By the time it ends its journey in the Northern Territory, the torch will have travelled through 11 towns, covered 2,450 kilometres, most of which will be by air charter. The torch's journey through Queensland will take 19 days, cover 4,370 k's, go through 174 towns using 1,870 torch bearers. Not to mention it's a rather unconventional underwater journey through our own Great Barrier Reef. Then it heads to Western Australia for a 10-day breeze through 41 towns, coasting along 1,605 kilometres of road and flying 3,275 k's. Not to mention the camel ride in Broome and the 1,059 torchbearers tossed into the mix. <sighs> Moving on. Tuesday, July the 11th, South Australia gets the torch from Western Australia, care of the Indian Pacific Rail Line. After eight days, 800 torchbearers and 1,646 kilometres, the torch is passed on to Victoria. The Garden State will offer 2,165 residents the chance to carry the torch through 161 towns, covering 3,464 k's over a period of 21 days, when it finally relinquishes the flame to Tasmania. The Bass Strait Ferry will spirit the torch across the Tasman to our island state, where it will travel for five days, allowing 478 people the opportunity of carrying the torch 842 k's. As the torch makes its way back to the mainland, it'll go through Australia's Capital Territory before heading into New South Wales. For a journey lasting 36 days, it'll cover 5,506 kilometres with the assistance of 3,600 and 19 torch bearers. And finally, as the torch reaches the end of its journey here at the Olympic Stadium, the 110,000 people packed into this massive arena will erupt simultaneously, heralding the start of the 2000 Olympic Games. Nice torch, Trace. Yeah, yeah it's terrific. Good it's technique too on the running. You look you know, 1956, right at home. Melbourne, 1956, original torch. torch. Yep. Yeah. Thank you to Gary Fenton from the Sydney Olympic Broadcasting Organisation who lent us that. The flame is going to travel within an hour's drive of 85% of the population, so there's a great chance that it's going to be passing your door. Now, wouldn't it be great to carry the torch? What a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Next year at the Games, we'll be giving away the chance to do just that. As the relay approaches, we'll be giving viewers from each state the chance to win a spot in Olympic history. Now, that is a competition we'd all like to win. Wouldn't it be terrific? Excellent. I mean, so much a part of it. But now, <laughs> it's time for the Games News with Seven Nightly News' Paul Marshall. 
Westpac is the first company to buy time on the Seven Network's Olympic Games coverage, paying $13.9 million to become an Olympic telecast partner. Greg Norman will market and promote the 2000 Olympic Games. As part of the deal, he'll raise money for Australian athletes and help fit out the thousands of volunteers. And there's going to be a few of your hats around, the volunteers. Yeah, actually, you can count about 40,000 of them, so there'll be a lot there. <laughs> And for Kathy Freeman this week, good news. Doctors have given her the all clear to resume training. The foot injury she sustained earlier in the year has all but healed, so Kathy will be back on track for Sydney 2000, starting with her first training session at Olympic Park on Monday. After the break, we travel down the Olympic fashion time tunnel and discover in some places a very tight squeeze the hero who inspires these kids to train like dolphins. And I'm sure all the boys in the squad look up to him as a true legend. And the mighty MCG versus the AIS. Oh, the one on the left says footy and the other one's touch of health about it, I can, I can sense it. <laughs> Which Australian Olympian drives a red Lamborghini and keeps a Porsche and a Hummer in his garage? Is it Kieran Perkins, Lisa Curry Kenny, or Mark Philippoussis? The answer coming up next on the game's birthday. <laughs> Celebrating his birthday this week is Atlanta Olympic tennis player Mark Philippoussis, the man with a fancy for cars as quick as his serve. He turns 22. You make a fabulous uniform in Aboriginal colours. Basically, I'd have them all wearing sarongs and sandals if I had it my way. Something really tight. We're set with the green and gold now. Why, why swap? Um, black. I'll put them in blue and the girls pink. When you see them walking with their hats, then when they all strut up the ear, that oh, I stop me. <laughs> I don't know, koalas and kangaroos and Australian symbols. <laughs> Some interesting ideas there, Neil. Yeah, what Would you, you be too happy with many of them? I don't know. What about the koalas? Hats. Hats. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. It's hard <laughs> to make everyone happy all the time. One thing I do know is when you walk out for your country in an opening ceremony, the eyes of the world are watching and you really do want to look your best. Neil went back through the Olympic fashion time tunnel. He probably just looked through his own wardrobe, in fact, to reminisce those classic style moments of days gone by. Oh. How we danced. London 1908 and the first year the Olympics went formal. Trouble was, no one told us we had to dress up. So in typical Aussie style, our boys marched onto the stadium in singlets with green and yellow ribbon tied hastily round their shorts. Determined not to look the poor relations next time round, for Stockholm we donned bow ties, green blazers and long gowns for the ladies. By the time we strutted our stuff in 52 for Helsinki and the 56 Melbourne Games, the yellow of the golden wattle, our national flower, was firmly entrenched in our psyche. Our top female athletes became our golden girls and in turn, they became our top models. Skirts became a little shorter, but gloves and hats were compulsory. And in Rome in 1960, what woman would be seen dead marching without her purse? Never without controversy, our 1964 effort was described by some as looking like it just might have borrowed or maybe even nicked the outfits from the TAA change rooms. But many still say our men's uniforms of the 60s were our most stylish ever, looking more like a rat pack than a team of athletes. <laughs> In 76, we lost hats for the first time, and what else but wrap round skirts and platform shoes for the girls, and of course, crotch hugging trousers for the men. Into the 80s, Prue Acton said she designed that year's outfit to catch and hold the audience of millions of TV viewers. Our athletes marched into the stadium resplendent in flocks of emus, koalas, and governor and leaf necklaces. She was right, a never to be forgotten fashion moment. Now that designers had twigged that they only had a few seconds to flaunt their creations on international TV, the aim became maximum impact. And then came the Australian team, 298 athletes dressed in the now familiar Akubras and Dryzer bones. 
In 1992, our athletes not only sported official wear and travel wear, they also had formal wear, informal wear, and simple old lazing around the village wear. And this was the marching wear for Barcelona. They look just great here in the stadium. Such anticipation and high hopes for this team. The grand tradition of green and gold was put aside last time for something a little different. And for the first time, our athletes were consulted about the design of their garments. They're practical people. Their main gripe had always been, we don't like ironing. As they make their way out into this main stadium. It's such a huge business now, but I mean, let's get back to basics. This is the towel that it's Murray Rose used to dry himself after he won gold in uh, 1956. I hope he's washed it. I think he has, but what about this? I think someone's washed that, haven't they? <laughs> I think they must have put it in the dryer. No, this, this is the blazer <laughs> I had at the Moscow Olympics in 1980, and just like the day I got it, it fits like a glove. Mm, so do the cozies, <coughs> don't they? Yeah, so yeah just, I like you parading around in there. feel natural. Huh? Mm. What do you think? Not bad. Look, could be in the Australian cricket team. Don't go away. We've got lots more to come on the games. Getting dirty at Homebush. Hey, Tracy, where are your high heel shoes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. As if I was going to wear them here, Peter. I do know some things about the environment. And why these kids are jumping with pride. Fraser Coombs and I'm at Brisbane Boys College where Kieran Perkins went to school. It's great to have Kieran as an old boy at the school because it inspires the squad to race faster and train harder than we ever have before towards the Olympic gold. Everyone loves the king of the sea. One of Kieran's major achievements while he was still at school was in 1991 at the Pan Pack Games. Can he get seven? is my hero and I'm sure all the boys in the squad look up to him as a true legend. Go, <laughs> uh, those that were was the days. Uh, I remember getting the horse and cart to school. Huh? My inspiration, my dad actually, funny enough, great bloke my old man. Thanks for watching dad. <laughs> While the athletes of the country are working towards Olympic gold, there's another team of Australians with a passion for green. Peter Ottison's just one of a huge team of people dedicated to making 2000 the most environmentally sound games ever. I spoke to the man who will be bringing home the green. So Peter, where are the green and golden bell frogs? There's a really good colony living in the brick pit. It's, uh, they reckon there's about 300 of them. Do they make a big noise? Well, frogs generally do make noises and they're usually at night and uh, they have a very important role. That's usually the males and their job is to try and attract uh, females of the species, so... Not really all that much different to <laughs> humans, are they? That's, that's true, that's, that's very true. <laughs> the discovery of an endangered species of frog on the site almost pales into insignificance when you talk to Peter Otterson about his passion delivering the greenest games the world has ever seen. I mean, there's a great story with that train station. It's an outstanding design, it's won a national award, but it's environmentally clever. So the issue is that you can achieve environmental cleverness and you don't need to compromise in design and it doesn't need to threaten your budget. I mean, that hill there is 20 metres high, it's grassed, treed, looks remarkable. But underneath that, 20 metres high of, of waste. Homebush Bay had been Sydney's garbage tin, so like all good greenies should, they decided to deal with the problem on site. So that land which was lost has now been converted to valuable use. Visitors will be able to stroll through over 80 hectares of parkland and even explore natural estuary and wetland areas. Hey Tracy, where are your high heel shoes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. As if I was going to wear them here, Peter. I do know some things about the environment. How many people are there working on the environment program in the Olympics? 
everyone involved in this business is doing something about environment. And it's, it's like, in a way, managing the whole of the Olympic Games. There are our sponsors, our licensees, our suppliers, and even the environment groups. And uh, they continue to have a strong role and interest in what they're doing. So I regard everyone as having a role in this, this, this game. Even the athletes? Because that's what the Olympics is really all oh, about. Oh, yes, that's right. People keep reminding me that's what it's about. <laughs> It's a remarkable opportunity, I think, to be able to demonstrate to the world that we are clever, that we do understand our environment, we understand the environment and its importance to us as a country, but also it's important to, to the future of our children, but also we have an important role in terms of the global situation. They have done an amazing job out there. Remember that all of Homebush Bay is a sensitive wetlands area and SOCOG and the Olympic Coordination Authority have been able to find a balance. Yeah, they have done a great job and you too could be involved. If you want to contribute to the Green Olympic Agenda and improve your local environment, you can participate in the Olympic Land Care Project, an initiative to plant over 2 million trees across Australia before the Games start in 2000. For more information, give Landcare a call on 1800 151 105. Still to come on the Games, the Great Games Challenge, the mighty MCG versus the AIS and your Olympic survival kit for the Games. Did you know that over 10,200 athletes from 197 countries will compete in the 2000 Games? That's the most ever in the history of the Olympiad. Welcome back to the Games. If you want to win free tickets to the opening and closing ceremonies for 2000, you must be a member of the Olympic Club. Here at the Games, we're giving away two family memberships to the Olympic Club each and every week. A prize valued at over $300. We will draw our weekly winner from all the letters, pictures and emails we receive from you each week. So drop us a line at lockbag 777 Epping, New South Wales 2121 or email us here at the Games at 7.com.au. This week's winners of the family memberships are Nick Mormill of Victor Harbour in South Australia. Nick is 11 years old and had this fantastic painting of the Olympic torch. Yes, and Catherine Sawicki from the ACT for this superb letter. And it starts off, Trace, by saying, who should light the Olympic torch? Why, someone who's made the running track scorch. A fantastic athlete through and through, someone well known to me and you. Though of late she's been ill, still she surely fits the bill. A great inspiration to Aussies all the same, Betty, Betty Cuthbert is yeah. her name and she's had a lot of support. She's got my mum's vote too. Congratulations to both of our winners this week. Now here's a story that touches me personally. Very personal, this one. You see, I have an undying love for the great Aussie meat pie. <laughs> so when I heard that the Institute of Sport in Canberra was thinking of tampering with the old Aussie recipe, I had to go down there and defend the Aussie icon. So what made you come up with the idea for a low-fat pie? It's almost un-Australian. <laughs> it's very un-Australian, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, we were trying to um, really just give the food that the athletes actually uh, like. They love eating pies. It was, yeah, it was a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of a fun for this show as well, just to see if um, the chefs in the kitchen could come up with because something. Because you know like I am that. a pie connoisseur. I've heard that. <laughs> Swimming was just another life. My real life is committed to pies. Testing pies. Yes. Nikki was feeling confident in her new AIS pie, so we got six blindfolded athletes from the Institute and put it to the test. The pie of champions versus my personal favourite, the all-fat MCG variety. Which one do you like best? They're both pretty good, but I think probably... Uh, I like the one on the left a little bit better. Nick? Uh, the one on the left says footy and the other one's... touch of health about it, I can, I can sense it. <laughs> so you're saying left is... Left is the MCG? Left is and MCG. And right is the AIS. Mm. That's good, isn't it? Mm. That's really good. No one's eaten more pies than me. That is a really good pie. Yeah, that's a winner. How many pints did you eat oh, that just, day? Just a couple, honestly. Yeah. They, say, they say TV puts weight on, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> because you wouldn't believe it, would you, sitting here now? It's having to do stories like that, Neil, I know. <laughs> now it's time to announce the lucky Olympic Club members who have won tickets to the opening and closing ceremonies. 
Congratulations, and remember that each week the Olympic Club gives away over 200 free tickets to its members for all Olympic events. And you can look up the Games website for the full winner list. Neil, do you know all of the Olympic mascots? Oh, personally, very well. Friends of mine. Do you know which animals they are? Well, I've got a fair idea. The Olympics furry friends. Everyone loves to get a big hug from Ollie when they see him like this. <laughs> These guys may be the next Olympians, and so could you. And the lockup, an insider's view. This was That's Brooksy's right. idea, wasn't it? Come on. Brooksy, where are you? I know you're here. That's next week on The Games. I told you you should have paid those parking fines. I've never had any. Well, someone I've never had a car. fine of any sort. What? I know why you've got contacts at the police department <laughs> to be able to set up things like I'll that. I'll bake you a cake. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for this week, but remember, if you want any more information on anything you've seen on the Games, it's all available on our website at thegames.7.com.au. Or you can drop us a line at lockbag 777 Epping, New South Wales, 2121. Now, we've had a phenomenal response to the website and plenty of people writing into us. In fact, we've had loads of requests to rerun famous Olympic moments. So we've decided to revisit Olympic history. Peter Hughes, a mad hockey fan from South Australia, wrote in and asked to see the Hockey Roos slam home the goals in their gold medal winning performance in Atlanta. So here it is. See you next week. Bye. The Hockey Roos, their first penalty corner in this gold medal final. Annan. Goal, it's in. Alison Annan. Sensational. 17 minutes into the game. A goal here would be terrific. Yeah. Oh! Finish. Oh, Trini Powell, what a time to score the goal of the tournament. The goal of the century. Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, we're counting it down. Australia has won the gold medal in women's hockey, their second gold medal. Gucci, Australia.